Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Pokies Burke, and this is the Career Slay Podcast. Imagine the impact we could have on society if everyone loved what they did. That's what Career Slay is all about. I'm interviewing people who love their jobs and asking them how they got there and what they've learned along the way. We're here to slay the fear in career. Meg Griffiths is a director and producer. She began her career as a photo and video journalist at the Houston Chronicle and then held a leadership role at Teach for America, where she built the nonprofit's first video studio. After overseeing content development and digital strategy at a Los Angeles-based marketing agency, Meg co-founded Universe Creative, a documentary production company. Meg's work has been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize and is supported by the International Documentary Association and the Redford Center. She holds an MA in journalism from the University of Texas at Austin, and she just finished her first feature-length documentary titled Impossible Town. This episode has so much good career advice that we had a hard time highlighting the best parts. My conversation with Meg was so honest and uplifting, and I loved how she infuses storytelling into the work she does and how she makes an impact in the world through telling people's stories and sharing their perspectives. We also talk about being present in both work and family life, the struggles of being a career-driven mom, but also the rewards of seeing the reflection of our efforts in our daughters. We had such a beautiful conversation and I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Career Slay, Meg. We're so excited to have you. Thanks for having me, Kelly. I'm honored. You mainly know Michael, my husband, and you've worked with him before, but just tell us a little bit more about yourself and what your childhood was like. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to go way back then. Yeah. Um, I grew up in Houston, Texas. My mom was an entrepreneur. She was in the restaurant business. Not an easy place to be a restaurateur and not easy to be a single mom. So I grew up kind of watching my mom navigate a very male dominated field and watching her, you know, work her way up. And I think that really made an impression on me as a young woman. I knew from a really early age that storytelling mattered to me. Um, I can remember in second or third grade writing kind of like fake articles for the newspaper. Um, and we had an editor friend in the family. His name was David Bergen and he worked at all the big newspapers and I thought he was the coolest guy around. And he was my mentor, like literally from the time I was in third grade. So I was one of those rare people who was lucky enough to be really clear about what I wanted to do with my career. And I really never lost sight of that. What was it about storytelling that really drew you in? You know, I come from a long line of folks that I think fashion themselves as activists. My grandma uh, grew up in Vienna during the war and, you know, escaped the war and came here to America and met my grandfather. Um, And they both really dedicated their lives to giving back to their communities. And I just remember being fascinated by the stories that they told me about the people that they had met and the ways in which they'd been able to help them. And it made me think a lot from a young age about how I wanted to give back and what my role was. And I think I was always a visual person. I love taking photographs. Um, I love to listen. And so I think in my mind, those ideas came together, this idea that you could tell someone's story through a visual medium. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like all of my passions and interests aligned around that idea. That's so cool. So what did you end up studying? So... I studied English. (laughs) I went to a very small liberal arts school, so they didn't have a journalism program or a photography program. Mm -hmm. But I think, again, that connection to storytelling was really evident even in my choice to become an English major. Mm -hmm. Um, So I spent four years reading other people's stories, studying how people crafted narrative. And I always knew that, as I said, I wanted to be a journalist. So while I was in college, I interned as a photojournalist um, at the San Francisco Examiner and the Denver Post, I worked for the Associated Press. That on the ground experience, I think that that really impacted the way that I thought about and approach storytelling when I was during the summers working at these amazing organizations. That's awesome. So what did you do as a photojournalist? Man, um, it's funny. I mentioned my mom was in the restaurant business, and I'm going to make the connection here. But I think (laughs) that you really learn to do everything when you're a waitress. Mm -hmm. You learn to communicate. You learn to multitask. You learn how to really hear people and hear what they need and hear what they want. I mean, you learn so much about human nature. And you're doing math at the same time, right? You're like figuring out people's checks. Yeah. And I think that when I finally got into the field and started taking pictures professionally, I realized, like, oh, my gosh, there's this incredible connection between being a waitress 
and being a photojournalist because you're essentially like you're multitasking, right? Like you're doing the technical components of the job. Mm -hmm. You're doing the artistic part of the job because your job is to really take a photo that captures the essence of a moment. Mm -hmm. And then you're also communicating with people. Like you're trying to figure out where's this person coming from? How can I quickly build a relationship so that I can tell their story in a really impactful way? A day in a life was, you know, I would wake up in the morning, I'd get an email from my editors. They'd say, these are your assignments for the day. I'd be sent out across the city, sometimes to other states, partnered with a reporter and telling the stories of folks. You know, it, it could run the gamut from like a feature story mm -hmm. about an entrepreneur to like a fire that had broken out where people's lives were in danger. So I kind of never knew what I was going to wake up to. And I, I really loved that part of the job. What did you do after photojournalism? So after photojournalism, um, I decided to move into the nonprofit space. I really struggled because so much of my identity had been wrapped up in being a journalist and specifically a photojournalist. I worked so hard to get there. Mm -hmm. I did go on to go to graduate school at the University of Texas, and I got a degree in photojournalism. And when you're indoctrinated into the world of journalism, it's very much a language. I mean, I think it's probably like a lot of other industries, but you feel like it's so hard to make it. And yeah. once you make it, it's kind of like you give your life over to it. Right. And I remember feeling a bit of unease when newspapers went online. And a lot of the editorial decisions that were made on the website was driven by uh, views. Yeah. And I really struggled with that because I think I had initially gotten into journalism to have a positive impact on the world. Mm -hmm. I think that I... I really believed that storytelling could be a form of social justice. And I just struggled with the way that papers were kind of reconciling that. You know, the Houston Chronicle, we were reporting alongside some of these bigger papers that had much bigger viewerships. So those sources of revenue started to dry up a little bit. And I think that like a lot of other media companies were just kind of being reactive to what people were actually expressing interest in in the form of views. Mm -hmm. And that kind of drives... I guess the direction of the stories that you are wanting to tell, right? Yeah. And I think, I mean, it's interesting because for those of us that remember getting like the physical paper, yeah. the editors are making a decision about what news is important, right? They're saying like, this is on the front page of the newspaper. You can't search the newspaper. You get mm -hmm. it. You see what's on the front page. And somebody is making a decision about that. But I think when things moved over to the web, the viewer was deciding what was important. And so that really, I think, changed the landscape around like what editorial role do newspapers play in all of this? And obviously they're deciding what to cover, mm -hmm. but I just think it changed the landscape. I think I felt less agency over the direction that the stories that I was telling, how I was spending my time, I felt less agency around like what those stories were and what impact they were having based on how they were being delivered. And so that was kind of what led me to move into nonprofit work. Awesome. So what did you do in the nonprofit space? I had always had a real passion for education. My grandmother always used to tell me that education is the one thing that no one can take away from you. And, and that's really its value. And so I was like, well, if I'm going to work in education, what better organization than Teach for America? Um, and so I got a job at the organization working on the national team, creating content for teachers and those that were training teachers. And so I had a small team, two video producers that would go all around the country and capture content um, in classrooms. And so that was my first job at Teach for America. So the content that you were capturing was your audience, the teachers? Yeah, our audience was teachers. And so um, for those that don't know a lot about Teach for America's model, what they do is essentially take folks that haven't been in a classroom, usually folks graduating from college, and they apply to Teach for America. They get placed in a community and they get trained by Teach for America and the local staff to teach for two years. Okay. And so um, a big piece of that, obviously, is, is supporting novice teachers. And so we would create content from the field of some of our best teachers. What were some of their practices? How were they approaching behavior in the classroom or how were they building a connection with community and families um, in a place that maybe they had just moved to. So it really like ran the gamut in terms of how we were helping train teachers through a visual medium. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting too, because I think when I first started at the organization, I said to them, 
these folks that are learning to teach, they have the same like desires and interests as anybody that's consuming content. Like we can make it more interesting. We can make it story driven. And so almost immediately I started to build a vision for how we might start to tell stories within the organization that was much more rooted in, I think, the skills that I had built as a journalist. So I was on that team for, I think, two years. And then I basically, and I don't really know how I made this happen, but I convinced like everyone within that teacher training team and on the marketing team to merge our forces. Oh, cool. And I built a video studio at Teach for America. And this was like before there was really the term branded content, Mm -hmm. which is essentially what we were doing. We were telling stories about the organization that could help not only like train our novice teachers, but also help spread the word about the work that Teach for America was doing. And so by the end of my tenure there, I had built a team of like seven producers. And, you know, we built up like a big YouTube presence and we were able to share those videos with all the regions. So they had marketing materials all across the country. So it was, it was really fun. Um, And I learned a lot about how to build an audience. That's awesome. So why did you decide to leave Teach for America? So halfway through my time at Teach for America, when I was building out the marketing team, I met this guy, Scott Ferris. Mm -hmm. Um, He had been a teacher at through Teach for America. He taught um, on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. And funny enough, I didn't have any other core members. Uh, That's what Teach for America calls their teachers. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any core members on my team. So I had these like really talented producers out in the field who knew a lot about video production, but none of them had actually had the experience of being a teacher. Um, And I got an application from Scott. He'd been a core member and he'd also happened to have gone to film school. (laughs) Um, And I was like, oh, my gosh, like this guy has all the skills. And we talked and we immediately connected. It was clear that we had like a shared sense of values. And most importantly, I think for a creative partner, we had the same taste. So I brought him onto the team and we worked together there for many years. And we just realized like we loved working together. Um, And my next career move was at a creative agency. I think once you work in-house somewhere, Mm -hmm. you, you hear so much about the like creatives at Uh, agencies. And I think it like loomed very large in my mind that I was like, I want to be able to experience this. I want to like learn more about what it's like to be in an agency and, you know, work with clients. And so I decided to go over to a creative agency in Culver City and work there. Um, Our first big client was the Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. And so there was an an intersection of my interests around storytelling um, and education. And I said, Scott, why don't you come with me? We can do it. We can do it together. We can continue our work. And so we convinced the agency to hire not just me, but also Scott. <laughs> we're, we're a two man band. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. So was the agency focused on specifically nonprofit organizations? So the agency was not. Okay. Um, they were a traditional um, creative marketing agency in the sense that they worked for big brands. Um, they worked for startups we happen to get hired as a, a lot of agencies do this. They'll hire a team to kind of work on a specific project, mm-hmm. especially if they're the agency of record for that project. And so we got brought on to develop content for a platform that the Gates Foundation had endorsed that was supposed to build community amongst teachers. And so very fitting. It was very fitting. We were yeah. like the perfect fit for it. And so it was fun because we got to take our experience at TFA and kind of retrofit that for this audience. They brought me on initially for that project, but then I ended up becoming the vice president of digital strategy. And so I was working amongst our small leadership team to help grow our strategy business. Mm -hmm. It was an opportunity to learn a lot about how to run a business because I was kind of working alongside the four founders of this company, doing business development, working on pitch decks, putting together budgets, managing clients, managing a team of producers, and also just building the vision for the company as mm-hmm. we moved forward. So that the role really like blossomed and expanded in a way that was interesting. Wow, that's pretty incredible because you were this was your first agency job and you were able to kind of expand your scope to not just this one client but to you know take over digital strategy essentially how did you showcase you know your value to the organization to be able to expand your scope i think that it's a hard question yeah <laughs> There was a little bit of chaos. And I think I was like, I I have a vision for how to bring these things together. 
around how are we pitching to clients? Um, what is the opportunity or the white space in digital marketing um, and in social media? Because that was at a time when I think more and more, as I mentioned, like branded content became a term. Folks were using social media to reach their audiences. And so there was just a ton of opportunity in the space. And I think that has been another piece of my career that's been really interesting is kind of being like at the right place at the right time when things feel very chaotic and then figuring out like, well, how do you make the most of this opportunity? How do you give this chaos some order? So I know that's a little amorphous. No, that that actually, that's very like insightful because I think a lot of people, if they're in a situation where there is a lot of like tumultuous times in their organization, maybe the instinct is to run, but maybe there's an opportunity to say, hey, I can be a leader in this time and, you know, create some order and some vision for for others. The opportunity to build something out of nothing or out of chaos is in some ways, I think, what it takes there was never like a set path for my career. Anyone saying like, this is the way to do things or this is the Mm -hmm. order. There were just opportunities as I saw them. Right. So let's talk about your next opportunity after um, the agency. It's funny because at this point, I think Scott and I had worked together for five years. We'd made the leap from Teach for America to the agency. While we enjoyed working at the agency, I think what we recognized was that for us, when we got to work with clients that were purpose-driven, that the work was better, and we were more excited about what we were making. Right. And it was kind of a reminder for me to think back on like why I had initially become a storyteller was that I wanted to do good in the world through mm-hmm. storytelling. And so Scott and I started to hatch this plan. Well, what if we started our own company? Um, and it had an explicit focus on documentary storytelling and storytelling for good. Mm-hmm. Um, So we spent a year building our business plan, just really trying to pressure test the idea. And we were lucky because we had seen how Teach for America had run and we had seen how the agency had run. And so we were able to, I think, benefit from the folks that had come before us and taught us so much. So we created this business plan. We committed, we Mm -hmm. quit our jobs and we started Universe Creative, which is a documentary production company focused on social impact storytelling. That's so awesome. So tell me more about what you guys do at Universe Creative. So as I mentioned, our explicit goal is to create content in the social impact space. So we primarily work with nonprofits and foundations to help them tell their stories. But we also often work outside of that. Like we've been working on a scope with a big brand over the last several years that, you know, is trying to do work in the space of diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. We also just premiered our first feature length documentary called Impossible Town at Mountain Film in Telluride this weekend. So That was another project that we took on early on in the business. So the work really does run the gamut, but I think the the through line is that it's all purpose driven. How so? How do you pick your clients? Do you pick go out and pitch, or do they come find you? Well, it's funny. That was another piece. The business development piece, I think, was something that we really had to learn about as well early on. Like probably in the first two years of the company, we just had our six year anniversary. Congratulations. That's awesome. (laughs) I said that because I'm remembering like, when did we start? Yeah, we just had our six year anniversary. And I think early on, we, we imagined that it would be like a lot of pitching and responding to RFPs. But what's been wonderful is it's primarily been word of mouth. Um, And I think that that speaks to working with folks that share your same values. Mm -hmm. So we end up working just with a great group of people who, as I mentioned, are all purpose driven committed to doing good in the world. And I think that, um, you know, one project kind of leads to the next. It all feels very organic. That's amazing. Tell us more about the documentary and what that's about. Yeah, absolutely. So Impossible Town tells the story of one West Virginia physician's quest to save a toxic town. So the town that our protagonist, Dr. Ayn Amjad, has been trying to help It's called Minden, West Virginia. It's a town that was contaminated by chemicals from the mining industry. Oh, wow. Um, And this is a legacy that she uh, got handed by her father, who passed away from a heart attack. He was also a physician Mm -hmm. um, in the region and noticed these higher rates of cancer um, in in this small town. And when he passed away, Ayn took up the mantle 
Um, And after 40 years of fighting this fight, she decided to come up with a definitive solution to just move everyone out. She buys a 97-acre plot of land and tries to move the town there. And so we followed her journey for four years. Oh, my gosh. Takes four years to shoot a documentary. That's incredible. Well, congratulations on that. And I'm super excited to see it. Thank you. So have there been any challenges in your career that you've had to overcome? I mean, absolutely. I think, man, well, the first thing I'll say is I think that you have to be able to reinvent yourself. I mean, I kind of mentioned this crisis of conscience that I had leaving journalism. I And I remember I had a mentor at the paper. I was so torn up about leaving. I was like, if I leave, I can't come back. I, I don't see how my skills are transferable. And I just remember her saying to me, like, you have to remember that you've learned these skills in this industry and you can transfer these skills to do something else. You just have to think about it differently. And that probably seems like the most obvious piece of advice. But I think when you've been training to do something your whole life, it can be very hard to imagine how somebody on a marketing team or somebody on a filmmaking team would see your skills as valuable. And so I think that was a that was a struggle for me. I think on one hand, it can be um, very empowering to have a vision for your career. But I also think the downside to that is it can be hard to imagine other things. And I think when you're working in the media landscape, You have to be flexible and fluid because things change so fast. Mm -hmm. I would say another challenge is that, especially as a photojournalist, I was a woman working in a male-dominated field. I mean, you know, I would go shoot like Texans games and I'd be carrying all the gear that all the guys are carrying. And I'd be like the only woman in the, the press room carrying a camera it was very much like a boy's game. Mm -hmm. And I think that's still the case because I think if you're, the differences between being a photojournalist and a writer are massive in that a writer can do an interview after the fact. As a photographer, you have to be the first person there. You cannot miss the moment. Mm -hmm. And so what that meant is like, I would get a call in the middle of the night and they would say, there's a fire or there's a hurricane coming. You need to get in your car and drive towards (laughs) Towards the storm. (laughs) Everyone else is driving away. Yeah. Um, And it makes it very hard to have a family yeah. because you just can't always be home. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think during the 10 years that I worked as a a newspaper photographer, I had one mentor that had a child Mm -hmm. and she worked part time. Wow. So, you know, there just weren't a lot of women around. There wasn't a lot of opportunity for mentorship. It was hard for me to see myself in the field. Mm hmm. It was difficult for me to figure out what my identity was going to be in that space. And then I think even as I moved into being in a leadership position in the marketing world, that was hard too. It was often difficult to pitch. Like I had to really rev myself up to be like, okay, I'm going to walk into this room and I'm going to talk to the CEO as if we're equals. Yeah. Thank you for being so honest and and vulnerable about that. I want to dig in a little bit more into the aspect of you have a very demanding job. You chose a demanding career and, you know, the lack of mentorship, the lack of representation, but also the fact that you are a mom and, and you're doing the thing you're making movies and running your own company. Tell me more about how, how you make that work. Well, first of all, I just want to say to everyone that my nine-year-old daughter, Grace says hi. She's very (laughs) excited about (laughs) <laughs> me being on the podcast. Awesome. I mean, in some ways, I think it was inevitable that I was going to have the kind of life that I have. And I say that because my mom led a similar life. And to some extent, my grandmother did too. I mean, she was a homemaker, but she was an activist. Um, and it was her full-time job, you know, to be on the board of Planned Parenthood in the 60s. Like, oh, wow. you know, I mean, she was really a leader in her space, even though she was like technically a homemaker. And my mom, similarly, as I mentioned, worked in a male-dominated field. I mean, the restaurant industry is very rigorous. It's nights, it's weekends, it's holidays. Mm -hmm. And she was a single mom. Like, that is not an easy road. But I think that so much of my work ethic and many of the ways in which I've tied my identity to being a professional and having a purpose-driven career map back to those two role models. 
you know, I'm very aware of the trade-offs that I'm making when I have to go into the field for a week. And mm-hmm. it's not easy. And I don't think it's easy for Gray. It's not easy for my husband. It's not easy for me to be away. But I think that she understands why I do what I do. So I think that being able to explain that, not only for myself, but for like my forebears is is meaningful for the two of us to be able to have those conversations. I mean, Gray came to our movie premiere this weekend and I think it's cool for her to be able to see her mom yeah. doing something that she loves and having some success and impacting people around her. And then the other thing I'll say is that I think there are a lot of parents that spend 24-7 with their kids but are not very present. And there's no judgment. I'm just saying like, yeah. I see that. For me, when I'm home, I'm home and I'm with her and mm-hmm. she's my focus. So I think it's the commitment to like being very present wherever you are, whether it's I'm in the field filming with my subjects or I'm co-directing with Scott or I'm interfacing with a client or I'm with Gray and my daughter and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm with her. So I think the, the balance is in where you're putting your energy. Yeah. There's so many good things in there. And I love the fact that even though you didn't have traditional professional work role models, you saw that in your grandmother and your mother, and now you're doing the same thing for Gray. So that's a really beautiful 360. Thank you. Yeah. We, you know, they're both gone now. And so we try to talk a lot about the impact that they've had on me and that I hope they will have on her. And it's funny, I had such like a proud moment a couple of months ago because Gray came home from school and she was like, mom, I have a presentation that I want to show you. And she'd put together a deck for this nonprofit that she wanted (laughs) to start. I mean, she's nine. I had some feedback, but I was like, well, was this a school project or like, why are you doing this? And she's like, no, I just, I want to do this. I want to help. That's so awesome. That's incredible. And I mean, it, it kind of just goes to show that, you know, you living out your values is trickling down into how she's manifesting that as well, which is so cool. Yeah, it's been, she's, you know, I'm, I'm so proud of her and I can't wait to see what she does. That's awesome. Do you experience mom guilt? Oh, totally. <laughs> I mean, it's so funny. I'm always complaining to Scott that like, we'll go into the field and then people will find out I have a child and they're like, well, wh- who's taking care of her? And I'm like, well, her father, <laughs> like, you know, like, I don't think anyone would be asking him that right? if the, the roles were reversed. And I'm lucky to have a partner that is like an incredible father that, you know, is happy to support me and can be there when I'm not around. But of course, you always feel guilty. You feel, I feel guilty that like, basically, I've missed almost every first day of school since Grace started school because we've been shooting. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like you, you understand why you're doing it and you're talking to your kid about that, but there's nothing that can take away the experience of being like, I missed some key moments because I was doing this other thing. Right. And it's funny because my mom worked so much that I've been on the other side of it. So there's probably a lot of projection that happens there where you're like, I remember what it was like when my mom couldn't come to my volleyball games and now I'm missing Gray's soccer games. So like, how do you square it? But I try to step back. And again, I think it puts more of the onus on me to be like very present Mm -hmm. when I am with her and also be very clear about why I'm making the trade-offs that I am. And I remember reading a book before I had Gray when I was pregnant about how we often underestimate children's capacity to understand big ideas. Mm -hmm. And I've always, I've just leaned into that from the time that she was young. I'm like, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. Even if you don't fully understand it now, I'm going to keep saying it so that you're eventually going to really understand what my motivations are and what's behind it. Because I want you to be a part of the conversation. I don't want you to just feel like this is being done to you. And I feel like as evidenced by her, you know, kind of trying to, to follow suit in some way with creating her own nonprofit, I feel, I feel the fruit of that. That's so awesome. Yeah, no, I've I've had very similar experiences. And when I travel for work and leave Rosemary, there was actually one episode of Bluey where Bluey's mom goes to work. And I just started watching this with uh, Rosemary. And um, she was like, I don't want to watch Bluey anymore. And I was like, why? And she was like, where did Bluey's mommy go? And I was like, well, Bluey's mommy went to work, but she comes back. And she was like, I don't want to watch it anymore, but I've seen her evolve um, over time as she's gotten older. And I've started to similar to you articulate where I'm going, what I'm doing and why. And, and she gets it, you know, she's only two and a half, but she gets it. And she's 
adjusted, you know? Yeah, I think we underestimate kids in that way. And, you know, there was a study that came out several years ago, and maybe I'm just making myself feel better here, but like they say that (laughs) if you're type A, it's better because stress fuels your success. I don't know if that's true, but there was a study that came out that said the children of working moms and specifically girls that have working moms have much more successful and productive lives. Yeah. And I believe that's been true for me. And it's not to say there weren't trade-offs. And I think that my mom struggled with that. But I also think like, what a legacy to leave behind. And I remember my grandma saying this to me from the time I was a kid. She was like, I didn't want my husband to come home and to not have anything to report back on. Like I wanted to be able to say, like I had an impact in the world outside of our house. And that was really important to her. And no judgment, because I think it's all, everybody has to forge their own path. But mm-hmm. I think those were the models that were set before me. Yeah. And I believe that, you know, I'm I'm continuing that tradition. And I, I believe Gray will too. Yeah. And I think what else is super important to touch upon is that it takes a village to raise kids. It's like the onus is not just on mothers. I mean, like you have a supportive partner. I have a super supportive partner. And also... I remember my mom, she would work night shifts. And so I would hardly see her because our schedules were just opposite, you know, but my grandmother played a huge role in raising me. And I think having those uh, people in your life that kind of lift you up and, you know, are your additional, you know, almost like parents to your kids. I think that's super important to enable us as women to do what we do. Yeah. And I think there's a narrative very much and I think this taps into the mom guilt piece of it, but that we have to do everything. And it just is not the case. And I think it can be hard sometimes to let go. I find this with myself. Like I get really run down because it's like from the minute I wake up to the minute I go to bed, I'm doing things for other people, um, which is very fueling. But then sometimes I have to remind myself, like it's okay to take a break. It's okay to let somebody else do something for you, even if you're available, right? Like it's okay to take a day where you're like, I'm going to go for a hike or I'm going to do this yoga class or I'm going to do something that's just for me, even if it means I'm not spending time with the people that I love because I have to like refuel and recharge. And I think you're right. Like it requires having loved ones and friends and family around you that like believe in what you're doing and, and will support you because nobody can do it alone. Right. Right. That's so important. So what would you say is the most rewarding part of your job today? I think absolutely just the relationships that we're able to build. I think everything is about relationships and community and communication. Um, And there's nothing that I love more than being in the field and being on set and getting to talk to people. It is such a deep honor. And maybe you feel this way, Kelly, that like the minute you have a camera or microphone in front of somebody and they've agreed to tell their story it's like a weird form of therapy. And I always feel like so honored that people are willing to share. It's the bravest thing in the world. And I think we don't take it lightly. It it is a gift. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's funny because a lot of people have asked me like, well, why did you start the company? And we did have obviously a a strong vision that we wanted to create this purpose-driven production company. But for me, I missed being in the field, you know, like I went from being a one man band reporter for a decade to managing, you know, really large teams for big companies. There was a lot of responsibility there and it was really rewarding. But ultimately, I missed being in the field and the way that Scott and I have built the company is it's just really the two of us. We do everything. We do all the business development, all the creative producing, directing, shooting, editing. We have a small team around us that helps with some of the more technical aspects of the work that we do. But I mean, I wouldn't trade that for anything. People are always like, well, why don't you scale? Why don't you? And I'm like, because I don't want to run a company of 20 people, 50 people. I want to do the work. I want to be in the field, mm-hmm. sitting across from the person, asking the questions and getting to like understand our world more. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is what I love about what we get to do. That's so beautiful. And I can completely relate to the fact that, you know, when you're telling someone's story or you're giving them a platform, it's very almost life-giving in a way. And it is a great honor. And thank you so much for sharing your story now on Career Slay. I will say it's weird to be on the other side, (laughs) but thank you for for giving me the opportunity. So looking back, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? 
I think the advice I would give my 20 year old self is to not be afraid to reinvent. I think that we live in a world where everyone has to have a plan. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's easy to get mired in the idea of what we think we're going to be or what we're going to do. And I think that if you had asked me in my 20s, what are you going to be doing? I would have never imagined this. And I think being open to that idea of reinvention and really just like letting go yeah. is part of the beauty of the process. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. So if you had to sum up your career in three words, what would that be? Made of stories. Tell me more. Okay. Well, it's first of all, it's the tagline for our business. Oh. <laughs> our business is called Universe Creative. The tagline is the universe is made of stories, which is based on a Muriel Ruckheiser quote. And I think that really appealed to Scott and I because our business in its essence is, is really all about the stories that we get to tell, which goes back to what I was saying earlier about what I love about what I do. But I think that's really been like the through line of my career. Even when I was managing a digital marketing team and putting together a website, it was always about the story. Yeah. So made of stories. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful medium because it's stories that connect us to one another and that makes us more human and connects the world. Absolutely. I mean, I think that for real change to happen, we have to understand each other and yeah. that can only happen via storytelling and communication. And, mm -hmm. and I think there's such a lack of understanding in our country today of each other's lived experiences. And I think we see it as our mission to help break down some of those barriers through storytelling and help to elevate the stories of folks, as you said really beautifully earlier, like give them a platform to share what's important to them and what motivates them and to create a real full sense of their lives because everybody's life matters and we have to do better at trying to understand each other's perspectives. That's a beautiful perspective. Thank you for sharing. And thank you so much for sharing your story, Meg. It was awesome to get to catch up with you on Career Slay. And I know that you guys are going to do some great work. Thanks, Kelly. And I just have to say, uh, follow us on Instagram at Stories for Good and, and, and at Impossible Town. Hopefully you all can join us at an upcoming film festival or check out some of the stories that we're, we're telling on behalf of incredible people all across the country. Absolutely. Please check them out. Follow them. Thank you again for coming on to Career Slay, Meg. I couldn't have imagined a better way to spend a Friday. Thanks, Kelly. The Career Slay podcast is a co-production of Career Slay and Wild Reply, produced by Michael Burke. If you like the show, subscribe and give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. New episodes drop every other Tuesday, so stay tuned for some great conversations on slaying the fear in career. Mm -hmm.